Bob Goldthwaite is a prominent American stand-up comedian and director who reached a first career peak in the 1980s. Stand-up is a genre in which the politics of daily life, politics in its broadest sense, are often the subject of critique and absurdist ridicule. This aesthetics of politics influenced Goldthwaite's writing and production of his film God Bless America, released in 2011. The film is a black comedy which, regardless of how hilarious and surreal the plot becomes, feels like it was made by someone who truly cares and is deeply concerned about the direction his culture is taking. The plot concerns Frank Murdoch and Roxy Harmon, a middle-aged man and a young girl who go on a shooting rampage because they are fed up with the society around them. It draws on familiar cultural associations with the depressionary story of Bonnie and Clyde, in particular the mythic irrational picture of this first motorized serial killer clamor couple depicted in the 1967 film. Building on a literary tradition of cultural pessimism, reaching back to Christopher Lash, Robert Putnam, and Maurice Berman, Goldthwaite's film links these voices to a separate tradition of traveling serial killer narratives in such films as Falling Down, Badlands, and Natural Born Killers. God Bless America depicts the last terminal stages of an ongoing cultural crisis of community and civility in the United States. Approaching the death of the civic sphere and the commons from a different angle than movements such as Occupy Wall Street, which target an amoral and antisocial economic elite, Goldthwait's critique instead indicts the mass consumer majority of the population, portraying their descent into an omnipresent public theater of media-driven cruelty and boorish behavior that lies at the root of the decline of civil society. This triggers an anguished and despairing reaction from Frank, an everyman character locked into a routine office job, who is finally unable to tolerate the daily assault on his sensibilities from all those around him. Reeling from the diagnosis of a supposedly terminal illness, Frank goes on a campaign to kill a succession of character types that Goldthwaite has picked out of the general media environment to illustrate the new, in quotes, normality, poster children for a daily freak show of self-involved, infantile and aggressive rudeness. He's joined by Roxy, a high school girl who at first seems a victim of family abuse, but actually reveals a far more nihilistic attitude to modern society in the course of the film. Even if you don't fully agree with Goldsweight's conclusions about the sources of American cultural decay, the earnestness of the film is touching. Coming as a surprise from a pioneer of the mode of detached, ironic snarkiness that was prominent in public life in the US at the end of the 20th century, Goldsweight has produced a message film that represents a definitive break with the narcissistic playfulness of vulgarized postmodernism. The topic of a possible decline of the US as a world hegemon encompasses both discussions of its global role as well as the collapse of its model of domestic political economy, which assumed that material prosperity would resolve all political and existential questions. These approaches can sometimes overlook the roles of culture and values in a society mediated by communications technology. Can a democracy leave questions of community, value, and citizenship, and the education required for these, up to the market? In God Bless America, Goldthwaite reverses a commonly held trope in critical US public discourse. Instead of a basically decent population deceived by illusions and misinformation from powerful forces among the elites, it is the natural cruelty, selfishness, and vulgarity of the broad population that makes possible a system of environmentally unsustainable consumerism and cultural triviality at home, and by implication, a hostile, incurious, and predatory relationship with the rest of the world. In reversing blame downward, 
Goldthwaite also attempts to take away the critique of a collapse in public standards of behavior from the conservative right and reclaim it for a left of blame for having unleashed the plague of hedonism and narcissism in the first place. God Bless America employs a set of formal rhetorical strategies to carry out its social critique. The film starts with a camera's bird's eye moving over two adjoining units of a condo development. The first unit holds a young family with a crying baby watching TV. In the second unit, Frank, the main character, lies in his bed suffering from a migraine and hears everything going on in the family's unit next door. Their inane, loud conversation and the baby's incessant crying serves as a trigger for Frank's interior monologue, wherein he laments from a distance critical perspective the low levels to which conduct, speech, and thinking have plummeted. The family's refusal to modify their behavior despite his, requested, uh, despite his repeated requests for quiet suggests to him how nobody cares anymore about the real other in a world where everyone has become a self-absorbed narcissist. The wife says, I hate people who hate Michael Jackson. The husband responds, I would punch them in the face. Then the unthinkable happens. Frank breaks into the family next door with a shotgun, then shoots the loud television and the husband watching it. Then, as the wife, wife is holding up her baby off camera as a shield for herself, he shoots the off-camera child, blood spreading everywhere and drenching the face of the woman. Meanwhile, Brahms' Guten Abend, Gute Nacht plays in the background as white confetti flies around. Over the opening credits, we switch to Frank, who is revealed as still lying in his bed, having only fantasized the killing of the family. This, I would argue, opens up the possibility that the numerous killings that follow later in the movie are similarly imagined fantasies, although they are portrayed as real in the film's secondary, uh, secondary reality. This initial scene alerts the audience that this is fiction, hewing closely as it does to the filmic convention of concretely depicted wish fulfillment. This is insofar important as much progressive criticism of the film focuses on the extreme and open violence perpetrated by a character who actually seems to fit the left-wing critical profile. This suggests that the dream sequence has actually not succeeded in making such critics aware that we are dealing with a, uh, with a parable. What such reaction seems to have problems with is the unstable mix of serious real-life critique and imagined hyperbole. This misunderstanding might be caused by the fact that while these rhetorical strategies are taken from stand-up comedy, for a black comedy, the overall tone of the film is far too serious. The film identifies the dumbing down of the media world as the new Colosseum, in which we laugh at others, other people's humiliation. This new kind of opium for the masses according to the main character Frank in a long monologue, comes along when a mighty empire collapses. To the accusation of his co-worker that being against these shows is being against freedom of speech, Frank responds, and I quote, I would defend their freedom of speech if I thought it was in jeopardy. I would defend their freedom of speech to tell uninspired, bigoted, blowjob, gay bashing, racist and rape jokes all under the guise of being edgy. But that's not the edge, that's what sells. I mean, why have a civilization anymore if we no longer are interested in being civilized?" End quote. While we have fun watching the movie, we feel the same kind of guilty pleasure of watching people being humiliated and acting violently. There is no clear cut distinction between so-called reality TV, mediated fictional violence, and the real life. We get a broad range of examples of what the media and reality conveys to us that catch Frank's ire and or trigger a shooting attack. On TV, we see, for example, advertisements for a farting telephone ringtone, 
news coverage of demonstrations by hate groups, here a thinly disguised portrayal of the God hates facts activism of the Westboro Baptist Church, a scene from a reality show called Tough Girls in which one inmate of the usual apartment dwellers formula group throws a used tampon at a roommate, or Tea Party people physically assaulting a man with Parkinson's disease over the coming universal health care legislation. In his office job, Frank loses his, in his office, Frank loses his job because sending flowers to the female receptionist is interpreted as harassment. Later in the film, once the shooting rampage has started, he kills kids in a movie, movie theater goofing around during a screening of a documentary of the My Lai massacre or a guy who takes up two parking spots without apologizing for it. The shooting of individuals is triggered by an incident at home. Frank watches a show modeled after an episode in the real reality show, TV show My Super Sweet 16, in which a 16-year-old rich girl in the real show named Audrey Reese gets a car of the wrong kind for her birthday and acts out her disappointment in extremely aggressive, childish tantrums against her feckless parents. When Frank gets a phone call by his ex-wife, who is no longer able to control their daughter's rage, she got her a Blackberry, but the six-year-old wanted an iPhone. He realizes that the real-life aspect of the super, he realizes the real-life aspect of the super sweet 16 show. He decides to kill himself, but another clip from the show makes him decide to first shoot the reality TV girl and later also others. One particularly thorough example of media and audience cruelty repeatedly resurfaces through the entire film. The fictional talent competition titled American Superstars, a very thinly disguised stand-in for the real-life show American Idol. In the real world, in 2004, the American Idol contestant and singer William Hung, uh, Hung a son of Chinese immigrant parents, was repeatedly humiliated by the jury and the audience due to his spectacularly bad singing. Hung, however, or rather his management team, capitalized on his status as an object of mockery by setting up a website, attracting a big fan following and releasing two CDs. Goldthwait uses a similarly awful Latino singer as the stand-in for Hung in his film, but keeps the to the real storyline only extrapolating an extra level of morbid audience fascination with the attempted suicide of the contestant. Goldthwait takes this show as standing in for all the other reality and infotainment shows in which people are humiliated. Frank and Roxy show up in the real life studio of American Superstars finale to defend and revenge or avenge the Latino singer. After having shot the jury, Frank states his message, and we look at that clip. The important question is, who are you? America has become a cruel and vicious place. We reward the, the shallowest, the dumbest, the meanest, and the loudest. We no longer have any common sense of decency, no sense of shame. There's no right and wrong. The worst qualities in people are looked up to and celebrated. Lying, spreading fear, fine, as long as you make money doing it. We've become a nation of slogan saying, bile spewing hate mongers. We've lost our kindness, we've lost our soul. What have we become? When we take the, the weakest in our society, we hold them up to be ridiculed, laughed at for our sport and entertainment, laughed at to the point where they would literally rather kill themselves than live with us anymore. Frank? Yes, Stephen? I didn't try to kill myself because people were making fun of me. I tried to kill myself because they weren't going to put me on TV anymore.
you are a pretty girl. Thank you, Frank. Frank and Roxy realized that far from being a simple victim exploited by a gruel society addicted to spectacle, the singer himself is contaminated with the virus of mediatized experience after he states that he didn't try to kill himself because he had been humiliated, but because they didn't want to put him on the show again. Frank then also shoots him. Goldthwaite thereby suggests that the imperatives of mediatized experience have permeated the entire society. The difference between exploiters and the exploited have collapsed. The film takes up the tradition of the social problem cinema, a genre which had its beginnings, beginnings in the depressed 30s. Michael Ryan and Douglas Kellner write in the book Camera Politica, the politics and ideology of contemporary Hollywood film, <laughs> The social problem film genre has traditionally been a battleground between conservatives and liberals regarding such social issues as crime, political corruption, drugs, and youth gangs. By the 1970s, such movies had become mostly vehicles for anti-liberal statements with titles like Dirty Harry or Taxi Driver. Conservative films tended to portray crime as, quote, the result of an evil human nature not of social conditions. The notion of systemic evil is alien to it." End quote. Goldthwaite's film begins from this perspective, that the societal evil is induced by selected media figures, which he kills, but who, and who, as he says, deserve to die. The operative assumption is that media is corrupting people. The ending, however, suggests that by deciding to have the film's finale play out as a spectacular attack on the American Superstar season finale, that is, by aesthetically participating in this media spectacle, Goldthwaite begins a new assault on the system from the inside through over-identification. Similar to the way Klaus Tevelite mobilized personal life narratives to construct a compelling vision of the role of violence in the inner subjective world of fascism, Bob Goldthwaite confronts us through morbid black comedy with the disturbing possibility that mass consumer democracy has failed, or rather, that it contains the seeds of its own dissolution into meaningless spectacle and nihilism. There's a last irony to this film. It was released on 9-11 in 2011 the 10-year anniversary of the terrorist attack on the Twin Towers. The aftermath of 9-11 was at first the subject of positive interpretation as a time when people come together again as a shared, if wounded, community. Much contemporary commentary welcomed the eclipse of a vulgarized culture of relativisms, uh, post relativizing postmodernism and sneering irony to be replaced by a time of new values, sincerity, and even honest spirituality. Instead, the public culture of the United States in the decade and more since then seems rather to have developed even more in the direction of paranoid self-centeredness and hostile incuriosity. A new litany of non-contestable symbols, the flag, the army, the Bible, is matched by a humorless literalism in everyday life. Frank's annoying neighbor owns a vulgar yellow muscle car. Right before Frank steals it uh, to begin his bloody vendetta against ignorance and unkindness, he notices a Remember 9-11 sticker affixed to it. The immediate environments of most of the rude and unkind people he encounters are saturated with American flags. One scene after a protagonist's killing of an obnoxious and cynical right-wing TV commentator in New York shows Frank and Roxy sitting in Brooklyn at a spot which some famous 9-11 photos, from which some famous 9-11 photos were made. 
And I conclude, Goldthwait seems genuinely at a loss as to what has become of the United States in our time when existential crises do not bring people together anymore, but make them into hate mongers, lost in a media-generated fog of self-regard and infantile vulgarity. To expand on the film's title, you make a film like God Bless America only when it's clear that it's far too late. Thank you.